So this presentation is on teaching at CICS, um, though your PhD program would be focused primarily on research. Um, we also really value teaching here. And so there are some teaching requirements as well as some teaching opportunities that you would have as a student here in CICS. So my name is Emma Anderson. I am the Director of Inclusive Education and Teaching Support. My duties are to assign all TAs, including undergraduate TAs and any graders, um, support all those TAs. And, and when it's all told, we have about 300 students per semester who are working in classes to, in support roles. We have about uh, 90 TAs, 120 um, undergraduate TAs, and then somewhere between 40 and 60 um, master's student graders. I also support undergraduate and PhD students in growing as teachers. So I do teach the undergraduate uh, preparatory course for um, undergraduate TAs. Uh, I do not teach the PhD preparatory course, but I'll show you who's teaching that in a moment. Uh, I help with issues of classroom support and inclusivity and I talk to students about any issue, large or small, in the classroom or outside of the classroom. Uh, so that means that if you are a TA and you're experiencing some kind of difficult issue in your class, whether that's between you and a professor, between you and a student, between two students, between a student and a professor, um, I'm here to talk you through it and to help you out with it. Um, you are never alone in having to solve issues as a TA. Um, and also, I am one of those ask me anything kind of people. Um, so anything that comes to mind, um, awkward or uncomfortable, or just like about the human condition, like I'm here for you. So that's me. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about requirements. Um, so the first requirement that we have is that before you graduate, you have to take this course called 879. CompSci 879. This is a one credit course taught by um, professors Nina Thoda and Ivan Arroyo um, in opposite semesters. Um, so it's been in the past that um, I think Nina has taught it in the fall and Ivan has taught it in the spring. Um, but uh, we, we don't know what that will be, but both of those uh, folks are very, very well versed in education. Um, you will enroll in this course in your first semester as a TA whenever that happens. It doesn't have to happen necessarily in your first semester as a PhD student, uh, but it's a supportive course um, to sort of get you through your first semester of TAing. And though the course is focused on TAing, you do delve a little bit deeper into um, what it means to be an instructor and uh, what it means to be prepared to teach in an academic job going forward. Uh, and then the second requirement is that you have to TA at least one semester before you graduate. Um, some of our students TA only one semester to meet the requirement. Some of our students um, TA almost all of their semesters. It really depends on your lab and what kind of funding is there for research assistance, um, as well as your own interest in teaching. Some students are very, very interested in teaching and uh, want to take on more as a TA. Other students are focused on research. It really depends on what your goals are post-graduation, as well as um, your advisor's funding situation and um, what you and your advisor decide are your goals. Uh, you do have some control over which course you TA for. I send out a form mid-semester, uh, each semester, that allows you to tell me uh, which courses you'd prefer to TA for. Um, you also will tell me which courses you've taken, which courses you've TA'd in the past, um, and anything else that I should know, like uh, your advisor isn't sure whether you'll have a research assistantship or a teaching assistantship. Um, or maybe like you really, really want to work in your research area. Or maybe you've already spoken with a professor about being their TA. 
um, I can't attend to every single request. You know, like if everybody requested to TA master's level machine learning, I could not place everybody there. If everybody um, wanted to do uh, intro Python for non-majors, I could not put everybody there. Um, so some of it has to do with uh, what the needs of the college are and the needs of the college and the faculty are always going to come first. Um, but your needs are important as well. So it could be possible that you would be placed somewhere where you'd have to do some significant reviewing or learning in order to support the students in that class. Um, but we usually sort of make a plan for that. Um, and I'll have like spoken with you about it. And if you have a concern about your placement, I'm always happy to chat, even if I can't change it. So those are your two requirements for teaching during your PhD and CICS. Oh, goodness, I don't know what my Google Slides did here. Um, so if you want to go beyond TAing, we also offer a program called the Graduate Teaching Fellows. So this is a year long program. Um, it's a cohort training model, which means that you're with a group of students who are doing the same thing as you. Um, we ran this for the first time this year, which was very exciting. We had about eight or nine students who were participating. And um, the first thing that happens is the last one of the last weeks of the summer, uh, we do an online sort of boot camp program um, to get you ready to uh, to teach classes. Um, and then in the fall, you teach two sections of a first year seminar, which is a um, an introductory course for our first year students who are coming into the undergraduate program. And then you take on uh, one section of an introductory course in the spring. So that might be 121, which are which is our um, very basic introductory course. Um, and depending on your background, it could be another introductory course. Um, you are eligible for this program once you've done one successful TA ship. Um, so you're not eligible when you're coming in as a first semester student. We want you to kind of have your feet under you when you start this program. It does mean that you forgo funding for research for a year. Um, it doesn't mean you're not doing research, but it does mean that you have to sort of balance with your advisor the time you're spending on research versus teaching because it is a little bit more time intensive to be teaching your own class than to be a TA. Uh, and then if you do that program and you decide, wow, teaching is really for me, this is like really what I want to do and I want to bulk up my resume with um, teaching opportunities, uh, the really cool thing about UMass is that we are connected to a lot of other schools in the area. So we're part of what's called the Five College Consortium. Uh, this includes Mount Holyoke, Smith, Amherst College, and Hampshire College to some extent, though they're um, sort of on their way out um, as a college. Um, so we often send students to teach at Mount Holyoke for a semester, um, to teach at Smith for a semester. Um, we offer summer courses that are sometimes taught by graduate students. Um, and we're connected with community colleges in the area. There's at least uh, four that I can think of within driving distance that you might consider uh, teaching at as an adjunct uh, once you earn your master's degree. So we can connect you with a lot of opportunities to teach if that's something that you're interested in. And I just want to um, show you a couple of other folks that you might want to know. Uh, Nina Thoda, I mentioned her name before, she teaches um, the 879 course for TAs half of the time. She's also the associate, associate chair of teaching development and she is a senior teaching faculty. Her PhD is in computer science education. So she's very, very well versed in this kind of thing. And she's also just like a wonderful person to know. Um, so feel free to reach out to her. And then Erica Dawson Head, who is the director of diversity and inclusive community development. Um, Erica and I work very closely together on issues of inclusivity. So I always like to um, kind of show her off so that 
you know that there's another person to talk to about inclusion issues. Um, she does a lot more work in the community uh, beyond the classroom, uh, but is also just like happy to talk to students whenever. So that's really like all I have to present, but my vision for this session is that um, I'm happy to take questions um, about teaching. I'm happy to take questions about really anything you want to ask me um, and just chat a little bit. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. First of all, uh, I think that uh, is, is it possible to be a TA on your first semester? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so because you said you have to um, uh, to attend a, a course first, firstly, and uh, before you, you being an actual TA. Right. You attend the course actually concurrently with your first TA appointment. So a lot of the um, the assignments in the class are based on your TA appointment. So like you'll you'll do like a sort of a research experiment in education with the TA that you're doing. Um, so you don't need to take that class before you TA. It's a it's a concurrent class. Okay. And then my second the question is um, uh, uh, what are the matters that uh, uh, in which it depends if you will do only one semester TA or most of your semester will be, will be a TA, um, you are, you'll be a TA. I mean, uh, it depends only uh, by pro your professor or uh, are, are any other factors? It's really mostly your professor's funding. Um, okay. We guarantee that for five years, you will always have the opportunity to TA for your funding. Um, and often students will prioritize if they're offered a research assistantship or an RA, um, they'll prefer to do that because you're sort of killing two birds with one stone. You're, you're getting your research done and you're getting paid for it. Uh, the pay rate is the same for teaching assistantships and research assistantships. And okay. um, so, yeah, so is, is there uh, any, any part or in the acceptance letter that, uh, uh, can clarify whether or not you are be a TA uh, during your first semester? Unfortunately not. That's something that you'll need okay. to work out with your advisor and often it will take a long time. Um, I try and have all of the assignments done by late July um, and have contracts out to you because um, those appointments start early on unless um, you're an international student and you're not traveling until later. We, we make that work with your visa. Um, but sometimes faculty don't know about their grants until later. So it may be that you're hanging out for like most of August wondering, what am I gonna do in the fall? Um, but hopefully that's a conversation you can be involved in with your professor um, from the very beginning. I think some, some advisors have different philosophies about whether it's better to TA your first semester or better to RA your first semester. Sometimes that depends on whether you have prior research experience as a master's student or um, whether you're going to be um, like learning the ways of research with your faculty member. Because um, sometimes a faculty member will want you to like get some practice in research before they start paying you to do research. Other times faculty will say, I, I really want you to put most of your time into research uh, from the very beginning and really get started. So I don't want you to TA right away. So um, it's very dependent on the lab and the advisor. And so uh, um, uh, in the acceptance letter, uh, if uh, uh, the academic uh, year stipend for 20 hours per week assistance, if uh, it is either a TA or RA, it is not uh, defined. Uh, it will be defined, uh, I mean, uh, during the, the August. Yes. During August. Yes, it's not defined what, you're, what you'll be doing for those yeah, 20 okay. hours, but we do tell you how much we'll pay you and that you yeah, will yeah, be okay. paid. Um, okay. And then it's the same thing for your first summer. We also guarantee funding for one summer, which will be the first summer that you're here. Um, and that usually um, is an RA-ship or an internship. 
uh, but sometimes the funding isn't available for that. And so then we will guarantee you a summer TA position. OK, thank you. You're welcome. What other questions can I answer? Oh, yeah, uh, I want to ask that. I remember uh, I have seen there is like kind of an exam to test our English speaking ability before uh, in our first semester. So we either we have to have a higher than 26 score in total speaking or we have to pass the exam and we can do the TA, right? So um, a lot of schools do that. Uh, we don't actually do that. Um, oh, really? We don't require that you take another test. Um, Partially because when we look at TOEFL scores when we're doing admittance, our um, our requirements for TOEFL scores are higher than the universities, and um, so most of the time we don't really have a problem with that. But that course that you take your first semester is going to support your speaking skills as well. Um, so if you are wanting more experience doing um, speaking in English, then uh, that course will support you and can direct you to other resources on campus. But we don't require you to pass a test. Okay, I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Darren, I see you have your hand up. Yes. Uh, what variety of courses uh, do students typically TA for? So in your first semester, typically you'll be working on some kind of an undergraduate course. Um, and it depends on what your background is. So we teach our introductory sequence um, for like intro programming and data structures. Those are taught in Java. Um, and then we have a programming methodology course in JavaScript, um, a systems course in C, and there's a statistics course, and then there's a discrete mathematics course. Um, so those five courses are the ones that take the bulk of our TAs. Um, but sometimes people have like really great experiences in perhaps databases or um, I'm trying to think of where else. Oh, um, like web development. Um, so if you have like deep experience in one of those areas, we may um, put you on one of those courses. But usually in your first year, um, you're working on an undergraduate course. And then once you've taken graduate level courses, um, mm. any graduate level course you've taken can be one that you TA for in the future. Um, now I will tell you that everybody wants to do the machine learning courses. Um, so often that's like a, um, the, the faculty sort of get to handpick their, their TAs for, for those courses. Um, and sometimes it will be that you work with a faculty member who is in like sort of a niche field and uh, they really want to work with you as a TA. Um, so sometimes mm -hmm. faculty will rotate through giving, you know, most of their lab an RA, but like this is your semester to do a TA ship with me um, and you'll TA for your faculty member. We try and make it so that that doesn't happen all the time because that can be a little awkward. Um, having that dual responsibility to your faculty member of both research and teaching. Um, and we want you to get the experience of teaching many places, but that is something that commonly happens. Does that help? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, William. Uh, yeah, I have uh, I have two questions. One, one is a quicker one, so we'll start with that. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, uh, you were kind of mentioning some of the statistics about um, the, the amount of TAs there are, but uh, I was curious, like, how large is the undergraduate body and how large is the uh, the CS kind of the part or the CS student body and how has that kind of been changing? That's a great question. Um, so currently we have uh, 1400 undergraduates. Um, we have about 400 master students at any given time. And we have about 200 to 300 PhD students at any given time. Um, so we're close to 2000 students as a whole, and it's been growing quite a lot. And in addition to students in our department who are like officially majors in our department, we have undergraduates from other majors who want to take our courses. Um, and it is like really quite a quite an issue for us to try and find um, 
the seats and the support necessary to educate um, all of our students um, the way we would like to. Right. So I was wondering with that in mind, like how, how you mentioned that, you know, kind of in your first couple of semesters of TA, you probably would be doing an undergraduate um, uh, like intro to programming, maybe if you're doing the teaching fellowship or, or something similar, um, like how large are those classes? And um, uh, yeah, like what does that typically look like? Sure. So um, that those classes are normally 250 to 300 students. Um, and then part of the TA's responsibility for those classes is to um, run a discussion section. Um, mm -hmm. And discussion sections, we try to cap at 50 students. Um, sometimes these are called labs. It depends on the course. Um, our introductory programming class, we did switch up a few years ago um, so that all of the lectures are also 50 students. So we have um, 10 sections of 50 rather than one section of 500, which we used to lecture for. And that was sort of overwhelming. Um, so as a TA, you'll probably like have like 50 students that you're really working with, but you're also grading the work of up to 300 students. Um, and we assign TAs, uh, one TA per 50 students about. Um, that's what I try for. Um, and then in addition, we have one undergraduate student for every 25 students, or sorry, one undergraduate TA for every 25 students. So um, as a TA in one of those larger classes, you're working with like quite a large team uh, to support those students. And if you're in a discussion section, then you know, you'll lead the discussion section as a TA, but you'll also have two supportive undergraduate TAs. Thank you, that was, that's, uh... <laughs> makes a better mental picture for what it looks like. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Did I answer both your questions? You did. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let somebody else ask if they want. Uh, can you give a, a brief explanation? Uh, what is the discussion section? And uh, uh, like, uh, um, are there any specific hours for answering questions or, or is it something else? Yeah, so um, we have discussion sections or lab sections, and then we also have office hours. So a discussion section or a lab section is scheduled um, in like our course catalog, and students have to sign up for one. Um, often a attendance is required for those, or attendance is at least taken. Um, and it varies course by course what that looks like. Sometimes it's a chance for students to do group work um, on an assignment given in that discussion section. And uh, sometimes it's a, a review session. Sometimes there's actually material taught in that section. Um, it really depends on what the class is and where the class is in the semester. And then office hours are scheduled um, to the convenience of the TA and the undergraduate TA and the faculty member. And um, Typically, a TA will do like two hour, office hours per week, um, and that's when students can, you know, just like pop by and uh, ask any questions. Uh, in those undergraduate courses that are quite large, and there tend to be like lots of folks attending, um, so it becomes more of like a, a large tutorial session. Um, but in more um, more specific questions, or sorry, more specific classes, um, it's smaller, it's more like a one-on-one -on -one question answering mm -hmm. session. Thank you. You're welcome. I had, uh, I had some, um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit further on one thing you mentioned before. Um, you, you were mentioning that uh, the doing the graduate teaching fellowship and um, how you would kind of be the kind of lead instructor on a course over the course of a year, um, but that you would still have um, research responsibilities while you were doing that, even though you're not funded 
yeah um directly doing research uh i was wondering i i understand it'd be very different faculty to faculty members so it's hard to generalize but uh w- like what does that look like would you also be like potentially working on a conference paper during this time or is that research that you would be doing a little bit more uh personal growth or like i i guess how could you uh manage all of those things i i, I know that managing a classroom it can be a lot of work so uh, yeah it can be really tough day. <laughs> so so i will say that when we uh have you as the lead instructor for our classroom you're the lead instructor for a section so i can't think of anyone right now who's in the program who does not have a faculty member that they're co-teaching with in some way or form um so that lifts a little bit of the burden but you're right, it's still quite a lot of work to be managing a classroom on your own. Um, so when I say you still have research responsibilities, that's something that you sort of balance with your advisor. Um, so there are folks who have done the program and said to me, you know, I always have a conference deadline in the spring. Um, I don't think I can teach in the spring, but could I um, do my um, my teaching slot the following fall? And yes, we can do that. Um, so we can work around your conference paper schedule for your lab. Um, I just think of, you know, you're always doing research and what that looks like can vary greatly from year to year and semester to semester. Um, but since your PhD is primarily about research, it's not like you're off the hook um, when you have teaching responsibilities. You do have to sort of learn to balance those things, um, and which is why uh, enrolling in the fellows program is something that you want to do uh, in conversation with your advisor to make sure that like they're okay with you taking that time to teach and to learn how to teach um, and knowing that you're going to have necessarily less time to spend on research. And um, kind of a a little bit of a piggyback off of that question um, is, um, I wonder, I was wondering if you could speak towards like hiring uh trends and like how potentially doing a teaching fellowship or doing more ta shifts than maybe research focused semesters would speak to your ability to be hired as a you know as a, a tenure track faculty member somewhere um kind of like what what that looks like if, if that's like what people are looking for or if it's more about the research or does it depend on the college you know it depends like on the institution but we definitely have institutions that are like sort of group. So we talk about um, small liberal arts colleges, we call them SLACs for short. Um, we talk about R2 institutions, which are um, like state institutions that do like a little bit less research. They're more focused on teaching undergraduates than they are on um, putting out a lot of research. And then there are R1 institutions, UMass is an R1. Um, and at R1s, the focus is primarily on research. So if you want to work at a small liberal arts college, the emphasis is going to be on teaching and mentoring. So having taught a class will be really, really helpful. Um, having done TA ships where you're you know, really growing as a teacher, that will be very helpful. And any um, experience you can get mentoring undergraduate students in research will also be helpful. Um, at an R2, it's similar, but slightly less emphasis um, in teaching and slightly more emphasis on um, the research you're doing and the mentorship that you're doing. Um, and then at an R1, um, it sort of pains me to say this, but the, um, the full emphasis is on research. There's very little emphasis pa- placed on teaching unless you're applying for a teaching faculty position. If you want a tenure track position, they're going to be looking at your publications. um, And very little attention will be paid to um, the experience you have in teaching. So that's something that um, you'll need to explore as if you know that you want to work in academia, um, you may want to do some informational interviewing to figure out 
what kind of an institution you'd want to work for. Um, do you want to spend most of your time doing research? Do you want to be freed up more to be working with students directly? Uh, what is going to work for you? And one of the great things about being at UMass is that we have access to a wide variety of colleges and a wide variety of faculty that you can talk to and sort of figure out like what is going to work for me? What is what is it that I want um, when I apply for a job? Um, and I will say also that the bulk of our students actually end up in um, industry research positions rather than in um, academic research positions, though we have plenty that do uh, end up going on to uh, academic research positions or uh, academic teaching positions. A uh, quick Quick clarification. Sorry, I'm like I'm hogging the space. Uh, so if anyone has any, please uh, interrupt me. Uh, but uh, in the five colleges, just really quickly, are are those mostly R1, R2s, or R slacks? Or uh, we're the only R1 in the five okay. colleges, and the rest are slacks. The rest are slacks. Uh, Got it. Closest R2 WPI. I. Worcester Polytechnic Institute. I'm not sure if that's an R1 or an R2, but I know for sure that University of Vermont is an R2, and we have uh, a recent graduate who's a faculty member there. Um, so that that would be a place to sort of look at. Awesome. Thank you so much for yeah. that answer. Yeah, you're so welcome. What other questions can I answer? Evan, I noticed you're here, and I know you know a lot about our classes since you have been Hi, yeah. at UCA, but um, I'm curious if you have any goals for teaching that you want to see if UMass can fulfill. Um, okay, I have to think about this one. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to be a TA for 589, but that's really more of a, I just have to ask my advisor to let me. Yeah. Um, I don't have too many goals. I just, I wanted to hear your perspective on it. And uh, you gave also some really good career advice too, which I appreciate, so. Great. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're helpful. here. Glad you're thinking about UMass. Um, oh, yeah. uh, anybody else who's here, um, Evan has been an undergraduate TA for several semesters um, in our program and has done very well. And so. Thank you. We know each other already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna walk around. This has been very helpful. Yeah, Thank you. Good. Yeah. Take care. Yeah, and anybody's welcome to, to leave whenever. Um, but I, if there are more questions, I'm happy to stay as long as you'd like. Um, and you can ask me questions about things that are not about teaching. Um, though I might stop the recording, <laughs> depending on what you ask. I promise to be very honest. I guess just since we're since we're here and we're chatting, uh, I'm curious like how you've you've like what your experience teaching has been and kind of like your career path leading to like what you're doing now and how you're are you managing uh, all these people doing well, this teaching like what like how did how did that come to be for you? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I love talking about this because I have a very very winding path. Um, I went to a, a slack a small liberal arts college. And um, I was originally a computer science major, but um, I could not stand being the only woman. I just like couldn't do it. Uh, so I dropped and I ended up with a degree in gender, sexuality and feminist studies with a minor in computer science. Um, and I took three years off from school in which I worked in IT for a private elementary school in Seattle. Uh, and then I was deciding for myself whether I wanted a master's in computer science or a master's in education. I decided what I really wanted to do was I wanted to teach. 
So I got my master's in education. Um, I was a K-12 computer science and math teacher, uh, or I guess it was um, grade six through 12. I taught um, and ran a computer science department for uh, another private school in Seattle for four years. And um, then I really needed to get out of Seattle. So I left and came here. And um, I started at UMass actually as um, a co-director of diversity. So I was doing mostly diversity work, uh, but my dream had always been to um, teach other teachers. Uh, as soon as I was in school, like that was like working in a school, that was the thing that I really, really wanted to do. And so um, when there was the opportunity for someone to run all of these uh, teaching support programs, I sort of jumped at that. And um, I was extremely lucky that the department sort of allowed me to create my own position in which I'm able to do both diversity and um, this teaching support role. Um, and it's just been so rewarding to watch that grow and watch people grow as teachers. Um, you know, when I started, we weren't training our undergraduate TAs at all. Um, we just sort of like hire the ones with the highest grades and throw them in and see what worked. And um, now they're required to take a course with me for a semester um, during their first assignment. Um, and the same was developed for um, TAs around the same time, though I did not develop that course. Um, yeah, so so a little bit of a, a windy path, but um, it really is truly my dream job. It is what I've always wanted to do. I just didn't know it was possible. Um, so I like to tell students like, A, it's okay to give up on things um, and take a different path. And B, if you can imagine something that you could do, it might be possible in the future. Like, don't just shut yourself down. Just like go for it and build the thing that you want. That's an awesome story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It's, it's really cool to, to hear um, like your passion for, for these things being united. Um, what, uh, sorry. Yeah, I feel like uh, uh, Tung might have a question, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut up. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's OK. Uh, I really enjoy that. <laughs> and yeah, so maybe I can ask some, uh, maybe a little trivial question. And like, Based on your experience, uh, does TA, does any TA struggle to, you know, kind of pick up the necessary knowledge? Because, you know, if I, I don't know Java at all. So if I have, I, I was assigned to, to teach Java, then it must be a disaster. And maybe I would get some complaints from undergrad. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Does that um, usually happen? <laughs> yes, it does happen. Um, or, so the, the steps that I take to make sure it doesn't happen. First of all, um, I give you the opportunity to tell me what you do and do not know. Um, and I try as hard as possible to assign you to something in a language that you know. Um, I sometimes have a problem with like too many people only knowing Python and we don't teach enough courses in Python to like make that math work out. Um, so if you are new to Java, I would start you on the lowest level course um, so that you have less to learn. Um, I also really encourage you to um, sort of teach conceptually. Um, a lot of students really want you to just like debug their code for them all the time. Um, but you as a computer scientist, like somebody who's gonna do a computer science PhD, like you know enough about like conceptually how programming works to help students through that kind of thing. You can offload all of those like debugging questions onto your undergraduate TAs who have taken the course before. Um, so that's another way that you can sort of manage that for yourself. Uh, and then I will say that when there is um, somebody who really struggles and usually it's not about the content, usually the struggle is about communication between you and the instructor. Um, that's the thing I see most commonly and it's about um, I'd say maybe like three or four TAs per semester have this issue and there is a probation process. So if you do really poorly in your TA, um, you get put on probation for a semester, which means you have to meet with me once a month um, and 
like I provide additional training if you need it. The graduate school has a bunch of trainings um, that I can refer you to. Um, and the whole point is that I'm trying to support you in um, doing a better job. And I tell you what you need to improve on. And if you improve on those things in your next semester, then like no more probation, it's like not a thing anymore. But if you don't improve, then we won't give you a TA position again. Um, so there is like a way that I can deny you TA funding, but it just, it hasn't happened yet that I've had to deny somebody funding. Um, the only person who that happened to dropped out before uh, I had to say no. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hmm. William, you wanna take one more? <laughs> uh, if you're up for it. I'm up for it. <laughs> well, I was just curious, uh, you were talking about, um, you were talking about DEI and like what that means to you. And I was just wondering if you could speak to um, what you've noticed at, uh, with respect to that at, um, at UMass. And I don't know if this is a stop the recording <laughs> question or not now. I mean, I know. No, I don't think it is. I think is, that. Um, go for it. I think what I can say about DEI at UMass and particularly in CICS is that people here are really well-meaning. Like they really, really want to do right by students um, and sometimes don't know how. And that's why we have like DEI officers uh, to help support that. And usually the, um, the conversations that I have with people are like, you know, did you know that this is happening? Did you know that this person's being affected by your behavior in this way? Um, and they'll be like, no, I had no idea. How can we improve this? Most of the time, that's the conversation I have. And I've noticed from the time I started four years ago to now, um, there's been a huge, huge change in the way people engage with DEI. Um, faculty are much more engaged with it. Um, we have a lot more younger faculty now um, we've done a lot of hiring in the last four years. So that's part of it. I'm not saying that like, if you're older, you don't do DEI well. I'm just saying that um, like with new energy comes like new dedication to problems that feel new, even if they're old problems. Um, and we have a lot more staff than we used to. Um, and uh, staff, can dedicate their energy in different ways. Um, and a lot of times staff are better at like the logistical things, like we make meetings and we like make things happen. Um, so I've really, I've really seen that change positively on our enrollment numbers in terms of uh, gender distribution have really improved. We went from like 12% women in our undergraduate program when I started to uh, I think we're around 22% now, um, which, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't sound great, but like when we compare to other universities, like it's really not bad. Um, and we've put in a lot of effort there. Um, I think that the university as a whole needs um, more attention to issues of racism, um, sort of all across the board. Uh, and we do pay attention there. We have a new collective across the university. Um, we call it JEDI, and I don't remember what it stands for, like Justice, Education, Diversity, and Inclusion or something. Um, and it's like 30 people from across the university who are engaged in this kind of work. And we meet once a month and we talk about like what's going on. So like last month or this month, we spent a long time talking about how we can support our students who have ties to the Ukraine or to Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, had a really like great discussion about that. So those things are happening at the university. Academia is not necessarily structured in a way that uh, lends itself to DEI. So the biggest struggles I have are often structural um, and we, we run across that a lot. Um, but I think there's also been structural shift since I've started and I'm grateful for that. Um, I feel like I was going to say something else. Oh, also, I will just say that, like, um, you, you would probably hear this from graduate students, too. You're going to do the, like, PhD hand-raising session, which is, like, very, very useful. 
Um, Western Massachusetts is just like super white. Um, and like, that's just a thing. Um, I think that it's one of those like weird places that's like very, very like liberal and progressive and very full of wealthy white people. Hmm. Um, and that can, that can make some friction, especially for folks who are marginalized um, by race or class um, or international status. And I do hear about things happening in the community that are less than ideal. Um, but there's a supportive community here at CICS and there's definitely folks who will talk to you about that and help you through any issues that you're having. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm really, I'm happy to hear that there's people like you and, and a larger collective view that's working towards those issues. So, um, maybe not something that I face on a daily basis, but I, some change that I would like to see in, in computer science in general. So thanks for speaking to that. Of course. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to log off and okay. eat some lunch before the session, but thank you so much yeah. for answering all the questions. It's uh, been so great much. to chat with you. Um, have a great day. Yeah, have a great day. You too. Hi, Jung. We've uh, just finished most of the presentation, but if you have any questions related to teaching, um, I am happy to answer them. Oh, I see. Uh, this was recorded, right? Uh, yeah, this was recorded, so you can watch it later. The presentation is like 15 minutes long, and then we were just chatting. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, I was in the residential uh, room. Okay. Yeah. Well, questions. Uh, I think I just have a few uh, quick question. Sure. Um, so, if I go in as a first year, uh, how easy is it to actually get a TA opportunity? Or do you actually need like to take a few classes? Do you need like you know, so you're actually guaranteed to have a TA position if you need one uh, your first semester. Um, I'll just go back and show you the slide since you're here. Um, so your first semester as a TA in CICS, you take this one credit class called 879, um, and that supports your growth as a TA. Um, right. And I was telling folks earlier that um, in your first year before you've taken any classes, usually you'll be TAing for an undergraduate course. So that would be like intro programming, intro systems, uh, discrete math, something like that. Um, so no, we don't require you to have any particular preparation to be a TA. Um, and the determination of whether you're a TA or not is um, largely based on whether your advisor has grant funding to uh, fund you as a research assistant. Got it. Um, so in terms of the number of hours, I know people say uh, we are supposed to work 20 hours, but practically speaking, would you say that's a realistic number? It depends on the class. Um, I think that realistically, usually people are working around an average of 15 hours a week. Um, there are classes where like you'll mostly work five to 10 hours a week, but then there'll be uh, weeks when you're preparing for an exam or grading an exam, and then you're working like 25, 30 hours a week for like a week at a time. Um, and so it like sort of flows in and out and we see it as an average rather than as a like hard and fast 20 hours a week. Um, but if you're having problems with um, working more than 20 hours a week on a regular basis, I'm definitely here to help because um, that's not something that we want you to do. And sometimes professors just like misunderstand how long things take. Um, I was just gonna mention something else. Oh, um, we also offer, um, even though like we say a TA is 20 hours, we offer a half TA. And the difference with that is that um, you still get your tuition waiver with a half TA. It's just that you get half the salary. Um, so sometimes folks will 
want to do a half TA for a semester so that they can like focus more on research if their um, research advisor like doesn't have the funds for them. Or sometimes they'll have the funds for 10 hours of RA ship and then you'll do 10 hours of TA ship to supplement it. Uh, it depends on what your living expenses are like, um, what your debt situation is like. Some people can live on a half salary for a semester. Some people can't. Um, Got it. So it's actually possible to both be an I and a TI at the same time. Just it is. It's just not super usual. Um, Got it. But what That's I tell folks easy. is that, like, even when you're not an RA, you are doing research. Um, most of the time, this isn't true at every school, but here most of the time when you're an ra you're working towards your own research it's just dovetailing with your professor's research i know that there are some schools where an re ship is distinct from your own research and you're just supporting a faculty member so you have to do your own research on the side but often um for us it's the same thing um so like you're working towards getting your name on a paper if you're doing an ra ship um, now you're still going to be working towards getting your name on a paper if you're doing a TA ship. It's just that you're making your money another way and you might be doing less research work, even though your research work does continue. Mm, got it. Uh, I guess my last question would be, so at the moment, uh, do TA actually like hold uh, office hours, like physically interacting with other students or it's all remote? Um, it depends on the class. Um, some people are doing in-person office hours um, and some people are doing remote office hours. The university is very um, committed to doing as much in person as possible. Uh, and but students often prefer virtual office hours because they can go from their dorm room. They can go at like weird times of night. Um, so uh, all of our discussion sections are in person, um, yeah. which is kind of like a recitation sort of thing. Um, but office hours, the open question answer forums um, are some in person, some remote. And I have worked with some TAs who have larger office hours, like with our introductory classes, which are like 300 students per class. Um, often those office hours get very large. So I've been working with folks to find like better ventilated spaces or um, larger spaces so that people can not be crammed into an office, which is often a problem. Um, so I am like aware of that issue. It's not always like possible to solve, but I think that most people have been able to figure out a way to TA that feels safe for them. Got it. Okay, uh, I think that's all on my mind at the moment. Sorry for jumping at the last minute oh that's fine i'm happy to meet you happy to see you okay uh yeah that's all i'm in my uh, okay I, uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day yep yeah.